If you have your Bible, could I ask you to open to 1 Samuel chapter 12? I thank Paul for reading the second part. Um, but I'd like to read just the first part because that will kind of help us to understand a little bit more what's going on in this passage. So I will just read from 6, uh, chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. This is God's word. And Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have obeyed your voice in all that you have said to me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray. And behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until this day. Here I am. Testify against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Or whose donkey have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or from whose hand have I taken a bribe, bribe to blind my eyes with it? Testify against me and I will restore it to you. They said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. And he said to them, the Lord is witness against you. And his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. And they said, he is witness. And Samuel said to the people, the Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous deeds of the Lord that he performed for you and for your fathers. When Jacob went to Egypt and all the Egyptians oppressed him, then your fathers cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and made them dwell in this place. But they forgot the Lord their God. And he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, into the hand of the Philistine, into the hand of the king of Moab. And they fought against them. And they cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord. And have served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies that we may serve you. And the Lord sent Jerubbabel and Barak and um, Jephthah and Samuel and deliver you out of the hand of your enemies on every side. And you live in safety. This is the final farewell address that Samuel gave to the people of Israel. Now, you might be wondering, why is Samuel giving this tone of address? When you read through this passage, it seems like he's making an accusation. And this is actually, in a sense, very hard for us to understand because as we just read last week's passage, how the Lord actually brought about a great victory against an enemy of God's people. And this is through the hands of Saul. And this seems like it's part of God's plan. So why in the chapter following this, Instead of having a great victory celebration, spiking the football, why did he go on the seeming tirade against God's people? You know, this concept is actually pretty hard for us to understand. But this is a concept that's actually woven throughout all of Scripture, and I want to say it's woven through our Christian lives today as well. And it is actually summarized in one word, and that word is covenant. It's the word covenant. See, whenever God actually makes a relationship with his people, he always does it in what you call a covenant. In fact, what's really interesting in the Bible is that when it's still saying making a covenant, in Hebrew, they actually literally says you cut a covenant. You like almost like you cut a deal. 
And the whole point is the covenant is that there is actually some seriousness to it. And in the covenant, it's where you have someone who has a greater power, in this case, God, pledging support, pledging help, pledging protection, pledging security to someone, to a subordinate. And in response, the subordinate promised to be faithful to the king. And so what happens is that, you know, um, throughout Scripture, there are these covenants, and God made a covenant with his people. And there are always signs for these covenants. And if you remember the story of Abraham in chapter 15 of Genesis, God had promised that he would make, he would make Abraham's descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Abraham said, you know, how do I know this is true? So what God did is that he took, he had Abraham brought all these animals, oxen, and I think a couple birds, and he had them cut in half. And what you do, you cut in half, and if you read this later on in the story, it says Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and in his sleep he saw a torch marching between the pieces. We don't know what that means, but it's actually very highly significant. What God basically said is that God says, I promise to make you as numerous as the stars in the heavens, as sand on the sea, because if I do not, may I be cut in half like the bulls, like the oxen. God is making a powerful promise. And so in the old days when they make covenant treaty, they would actually march back and forth between these carcass, saying, if I don't keep those promises, may I be cut up like that. You know, to us, this is like a really strange way of doing things, but it's not. You know, it applies to you and me too. We're also under a covenant. Where? When Jesus in the upper room of the Last Supper, when he broke the bread, when he passed the cup, he says, this covenant is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And he made this covenant to his disciples, and by extension, he made it to all of us. So every month, really, you know, when the Bible talks about covenant renewal, every month when we come to the Lord's table, it's basically covenant renewal. The Lord Jesus says to us, he says, you know what? This is my body that's broken for you. This is my blood that's shed for you. And when we eat this bread, when we drink this cup, we basically agree with the Lord. Amen to him. So the problem in this passage here is that the people have broken the covenant. Yes, they have won a great victory. And that victory ultimately came from God. Like I shared last week that the Spirit of God filled up Saul. But in the big picture, they've broken the rule to do this. You know, I think this actually has, when I was reading this passage, it actually has a lot to say to, to us. You know, we're, we're actually a people under God's covenant as well. And we are very, we're Americans, we're pragmatic, we're pragmatists. And we, we do whatever works. But sometimes I wonder, sometimes I think we're like Israel. They look and they say, you know what? A, king's will, a king, a human king will solve this problem. 
Let's be pragmatic. Let's get a king. And sometimes we approach the Christian life the same way. You know, we have a very individualized view of the Christian life. But if this covenant view of the Christian faith is true, and I want to argue that it is, it still applies today, we are under obligation to Christ our Lord to follow him, to be faithful to him. And we as God's people, especially as God's people in this church, as members, we have an obligation to each other for accountability. So I want to look at this passage. I want to talk about how, why the covenant, first of all, um, the seriousness about the covenant and why the covenant is important. And first of all, the seriousness of breaking the covenant. Secondly, the consequence of breaking that covenant. But thirdly, and this is the wonderful part, the grace of God that's available even from when the covenant is broken. Let's look at this, um, let's look at Samuel's speech first. His speech is from verse 1 to verse 16. And this is a long speech, but this speech can be actually breaking down pretty easily into three different parts. What he said about himself, defense for himself. Secondly, um, accusation against the people. And third of all, impending judgment. And you see this actually in verse 2, verse 13, uh, verse 7, and verse 13. In each case, he opens up with the word, and now. So first of all, let's look at Samuel's defense of himself. In verse 1, he says, Behold, I have obeyed your voice and all that I have said to me. You have said to me and I have made a king over you. He made a king. And now behold, the king walks before you and I am old and gray. And behold, my sons are with you. I have walked before you from my youth until now. And he's, then he goes on, Here I am, testify against me. And then he asks the question, Did I take your oxen? Did I take your donkeys? Did I take all that, anything that belongs to you? And the people said, no. Now you ask yourself this question, why is he trying to justify himself? Why is that important? The important thing that he needs to justify himself is that he's ultimately standing in God's court. You see, what's happening is that Samuel is the last judge. After Samuel is going to be the kings. And this is a dramatic, dramatic change from the way Israel has always lived. Instead of really, instead of having a theocracy where they, people directly trusted God, they're going to have a king over their affairs. And they wanted a king like all the other nations. This was not something that was really, that, this was not something that was God's will, okay? Having a king is God's will eventually, but not having a king in which they're like all the other nations. So the question is, so Samuel had to make sure that he didn't do anything wrong that caused this. And so he said, did I take anything from you? And they said, absolutely not. You know, what's really interesting is that he even said that he was old and gray. And they have this king who just stepped out of a GQ magazine, tall, handsome. And he belonged, in a sense, to a bygone era. And he was about to phase in the history. But he needed to be, make sure that he's right before God. Let me just want to say one thing about this. Samuel was a good leader. 
he is a great pastor. In fact, he's probably one of the best pastors they ever had. You know what I've done now? I've actually started praying for my successor. Uh, I'll pass on eventually from here. But um, a church always needs a good pastor, a good man to be a shepherd. And this, this man is good. You know, in the church, God has given gift to the church for pastor, for pastors. But the pastor is still accountable before God. If you want to read a sermon that scares me, it's Jonathan Edwards' farewell sermon. Jonathan Edwards was the, probably the greatest mind America has ever produced in philosophy and theology. But he was pastor of a church, and after 20 years, they actually kicked him out. And he, they gave him the chance to preach one last sermon. That's a mistake. You know, yeah, it's a pastor to leave, don't let him preach. Um, but they, they let him preach. And in that sermon, farewell sermon, he basically said, laid it on the line, he says, you know what? One day I'm going to stand before God. On one side, you guys will be on the other side. I'm going to be held accountable. Did I rob anyone? Did I steal from anyone? Did I take anything that's not mine? And then he says, you know what? You people are going to be responsible how you responded to me. We're all before God, and there will be no partiality. That's pretty scary. But this is the kind of pastors that the church needs today. Maybe someone old, gray, Not the not your Hollywood good looking hot shot kind of guy. But who's faithful? That's what Samuel said he was. And the reason why he had to clear this out is because he is actually in God's court. Once everyone said that there's nothing that he's taken, the defendant became a prosecutor. He actually goes, dive in. Look at verse 6. He says, he dive into the people. He says, the Lord is witness who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought your father up out of the land of Egypt. And he goes through the whole history of God's people, how everywhere God has been faithful to his people in order to make them free. He gave them a theocracy. And they don't have to pay a huge amount of taxes. He made them free. But what's the problem with us people? We really don't value true freedom. What did Jesus say? He says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But in our own nature, we really want to be like the world. The world, Scripture tells us, is actually under bondage. But we want to be like other people, right? How many of you guys want to be known as hip? Raise your hand. Come on. Nobody? You guys are all liars. Uh, thank you, Christian. You are hip, so you don't need to try. We all want to be hip. I want to be hip. I want Abby to think her dad is hip. Still got it. It's cool. Just a little older, but still got it. 
I mean, that's the same struggle. I mean, that's what the people wanted. They want to be like everyone else. But here's the question. What if being hip means that you go directly against God's commands? What if being cool means that you, are, you have to take a stand against something that God's explicitly stated? Gets a little harder, doesn't it? See, but that's a struggle that we all have. We all know cool people and hip people who says something, who believes in something that the Bible says is wrong. Right? And what do you do? That's a struggle. Who are we going to believe? You see, that's what the people of Israel did in this passage. They believed in their own instincts instead of trusting God. See, what happens is that if you listen to what all the hip people say, who, or the hip people were against God's word says, you will end up in bondage. I mean, the big, biggest battle, what's the biggest battle today? It's sexuality. We all know that. And the question is, who will you believe? God? Ourselves. We all badly want to be hip. But there's a, there's a certain place, if you want to be faithful to God, you have to draw the line. And this is what, the, what God is saying. So let's look at, look at um, they want to have a leader. But here's the amazing thing, is that even in spite of that, God still give us his grace. Look at verse 13. And now behold the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. Behold, the Lord has set a king over you. You can just imagine how hard it is for Samuel to say this. He talked about how he was old and gray, right? He's basically an underappreciated mom. Bearing up the burden of his kids. Imagine the kids playing PS3 or your device. And then looking up and saying, Mom, when's dinner? Mom, where's my laundry? That's how it was for Samuel. That's God's servant. And that's why I mean, that, that we don't have that many servants of true servants of God. But we need good men. Especially for the elders. And I just think that we need to um, who are willing to do the noble task. Most of us are too afraid. But here, look at this passage. But Samuel is faithful. But look at what, he, what Samuel says. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. This is an amazing condescension by Samuel. He says, you know what? Your choice of this king is wrong. But, come as it may, we can't go back in history. Walk with God. Some of you are beating yourself over the head for something you did 20 years ago. Or 15 years ago. 
in which you cannot turn back. Stop it. Don't do that. You don't need to beat yourself over the head. The blood of Jesus is big enough to cover all of your sins. If you confess your sins to Christ, you do not need to beat yourself over the head anymore about this situation. Turn to him. Sometimes you may think that you made wrong career choice. God forbid think you married the wrong person. God has called you here. And he promises that he will take you through 100%. You just have to trust him. I mean, amazing God has looked down and he is continued to guard him. He says that you just, your job is serve and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. And if both you and the king who reign over you follow your God, it will be well. It's still, you're still under God's covenant. He will lead you through. But you know, for us as people, words are just words. I remember when I was a kid in Taiwan, we had like, um, when I was first, first grade, we, we had like homework in the summer. Isn't that crazy? It was a insane country. But we had homework in the summer. And we were supposed to do homework every day. And me being the good kid I am, never ever touched my homework until the day before school started. And I would just like freak out, you know, just, ah, and try to write everything as much as I can. You know, my mom would tell me, do your homework. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. My dad would tell me to do my homework. I said, okay, yeah, yeah. Tell my dad came down to me in the basement that day. I remember. I did my homework. It was scary. Dad in wrath, um, I can still feel a little bit in my behind. You know what? This is true for all of us. Words sometimes just doesn't work. And look at what God does. So God's tear gives a sign. Verse 16 says, Now therefore stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not we harvest today? I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of God in asking for yourselves a king. So you send Samuel call on the Lord, and the Lord sends thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. See, we, we, we can't understand this. But this is what is happening. It's wheat harvest time in summertime. It's like a time it never rains. It's like here in Wisconsin, we get tons of snowstorm, right? But imagine that if you get a major snowstorm in the 4th of July parade. That never happens. If that happens, you know something serious is happening. So the fact that Samuel called on the Lord and the Lord gave that storm on that day meant that God was doing something supernatural that was not seen. And people feared. They were terrified. You know, they know the judgment's coming. Friends and sisters, when God calls us to follow him, He tells us, he's not telling us suggestions. He gives us his laws, he gives us his commandments. These are for our good. A lot of times we, we break them to our own hurt. We like to follow what the culture says. 
very good example is sexual immorality is accepted pretty much across our culture. God has definite rules and laws what he says about that. And calling us to purity. And it's actually easy for us to think that they're optional. And God said they're not. And you know what? Sometimes God is gracious enough to us to let us see the consequences of our actions. God's been kind in my own life. He gives me glimpses of where I was heading. And God used those to change my life around. God is good. Lastly, let me, let me just share with you the grace of God. If they were afraid, okay. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die for we have added to all the sins of this evil to ask for ourselves a king. Again, let me just say this. It's not wrong to ask for a king because God, Moses had made stipulations for a king in Deuteronomy. What was wrong was that they want to be, have a king like every, all the other nations. They didn't want to stand out as God's people. They just want to be one in the crowd. Do you ever feel alone? Do you ever feel alone following Christ? Mike, have you ever felt alone? Never feel alone, huh? We're never alone, but I have felt lonely. Sometimes when you call, follow Christ, you may have to, God calls you to stand out. You see, God saved us for a reason. He saved us for the reason to show the world how good he is. He saved us for the reason to see what our lives are like who know Christ. He saved us for the reason to show the world what joy, love, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control looks like in this world. And Israel was supposed to be a reflection of that glory from God. But they didn't want it. I know it's a struggle for all of us. To us, well. Look at the grace of God available for you and me. Available for all of us who have compromised. All of us have done so. He says this. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Do not turn aside. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. And listen to this beautiful comment. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because he had pleased the Lord to make you as a people for himself. Which covenant is he talking about? At the very least, he's talking about the covenant God made with Abraham. See, the covenant he made with Abraham is, I'm going to make your people as great as the stars of heaven. Sand on the seashore. And so when God's made that covenant, God promised he'll make his people, Abraham's people, great. So he's going to keep that promise even in spite of his people. And that's God's goodness to us today. We have something far greater. It's the hand of Jesus. The Father, look at the nail-pierced hand of Jesus. The people that have been bought by his blood. 
And he says, I will never, ever let them go. Even in spite of who we are sometimes. You know, that's not a license to sin, brothers and sisters. We do have consequences when we do that. But in spite of our weakness, our God is good. So he made this promise, and he made additional promises. It says, verse 23, more of us for me. Far be it for me that I should not sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Excellent pastor. He prayed for his people. In addition to the promise that God has already, he's going to pray for them. You know, we have something far better in the new covenant. Who prays for you? Your mama prays for you. But see, someone else, creator, prays for you. It's Jesus himself. Jesus is our great high priest. In Hebrews 7, 25, it says that he never sees to make intercession for them, for us. Now, we know that Jesus' prayers is answered because he always prays according to God's will. And not only is his prayer answered, but he's always sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He's right next to him. And he prays night and day, and he never dies. So we have a, we have a great high priest. You know what? Jesus is also a prophet. He's a prophet because he tells us God's truth, God's word, and where to go. He's given us that through the Spirit to lead us by His Word. That's why we need to read God's Word. And last of all, what is Jesus? He's the King. We can't help but want someone to worship. We are made to worship. Even if you're here as an atheist, You are made to worship. You will worship something. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever. Something will control you. And so in many ways, it's understandable why the people wanted a king. Why we want to be like other people. That's who we are. What the Bible says here really is that in a sense you have that desire. But what do you need to realize is that your desire to worship something is met in the ultimate king and that's Jesus. If we look at everything else it's just a cheap substitute. It will never, ever satisfy. We need a king. So here at this end, we see there's a tension between the king and the prophet and the priest. But in God's economy, there's no tension. It's all found in the person of Jesus. And he's the one who leads us in God's new covenant. Let me just ask you a couple questions here. Like I say, we are still under God's covenant. We are under the new covenant. Christ is saying to us, follow me, walk with me. I love you. Are you following, obeying Christ in his new covenant? Or are you living your life any way you want? There are consequences, brothers and sisters. And the storm is a, is a sign 
of the judgment of God that comes. But the amazing thing is that he still he invites us to turn to him this day. If we have wandered from him, to repent, to seek him, to follow him, and he will restore us. Where are you today? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you again for your word.